I am asking you, where did Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said that he died on the cross for your sin? That is the teaching of Paul. Are you following Paul or are you following Jesus Christ, peace be upon him? Nowhere in the Bible. And even if we read the Bible correctly, even according to the Bible, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he did not die on the cross. <laughs> And even if we read the Bible correctly, even according to the Bible, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he did not die on the cross. conquest of death. The physical resurrection from the dead of Jesus is the cornerstone of Christianity. So what evidence is there that the resurrection really happened? Let me summarize under four main headings. First of all, his absence from the tomb. Uh, first, it's been suggested that Jesus didn't and he recovered in some way in the cool of the tomb. But if any of you have seen Mel Gibson's film, The Passion, you know that what it means to undergo a Roman flogging and crucifixion. People didn't survive that. Uh, furthermore, there's a fascinating piece of evidence. Would you like to turn to John chapter 19, verse 33? But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. That breaking legs was to speed up death by crucifixion. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. It appears that there had been a separation of the clot and the serum, which we now know is good medical evidence that he was dead. But they didn't have that medical evidence at the time. They were simply writing it because that's what happened. Other people say, well, maybe robbers stole the body. That's the least likely of all because I haven't actually talked about the empty tomb because the tomb was not empty. Jesus' body was absent. When the disciples got to the tomb, they found the grave clothes, which were the only valuable thing, the only thing that, for robbers to take. They had collapsed, like a caterpillar's cocoon when the butterflies emerged. And when they saw that, they believed. Second piece of evidence. First, uh, the absence of Jesus' body from the tomb. Secondly, uh, his presence with the disciples. He was seen. Sometimes people say, well, hallucination. Yeah, people do hallucinate, but it is highly unlikely that even two people would have the same hallucination. Jesus appeared on 11 separate occasions, on one occasion, to more than 500 people at one time. 500 people could not have the same hallucination. And then, third piece of evidence is the immediate impact. Here were a, a group of disciples who were discouraged, depressed, fearful, hiding. And something occurred totally changed them so that they went around telling everybody we've seen Jesus Jesus is alive and, and then you, you get this historical phenomenon we know about which is the birth and growth of the Christian church and, and it's an extraordinary phenomenon because be, beginning with with a group of basically fishermen and tax collectors there's this explosion in 300 years right across the whole known world uh, it's a story of a, a peaceful revolution with no parallel, really, in the history of the world. Fourth piece of evidence is, is, is Christian experience down the ages. Countless millions of people down the ages have experienced 
the risen Jesus Christ. Uh, and it's people of every ethnicity, continent, nationality, every economic, social, intellectual background from all walks of life. They unite in this common experience of the risen Jesus. Millions of Christians all around the world today experiencing this relationship. I, I told you at the, at the beginning that I, I, through reading the New Testament, I came to the conclusion it's true. But I didn't want to become a Christian. I thought if I become a Christian, my life will be miserable from now on. I, I, and I tried to put it off. I tried to find ways not to become a Christian. But eventually, I, I basically, I just said, yes. And at that moment, I experienced, I think what unconsciously, I've been searching for all my life. I experienced something that gave ultimate meaning and purpose to life in a relationship with Jesus. And that was the last place in the world I expected to find it. It was at that moment it kind of dropped from my head to my heart. Sherlock Holmes said this, he said, when you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. And I suppose what I've been trying to argue tonight is that when you look at the claims of Jesus, who he said he was, and the possibilities of him being evil or deluded, I think we can rule them out as, as being impossible. When you look at his teaching, his life, his character, his fulfillment of prophecy, his resurrection from the dead, those explanations become, uh, to say that he was evil or deluded is kind of absurd, it's illogical. C.S. Lewis put it like this, he said, we're, we're faced then with a frightening alternative. The man we're talking about was and is just what he said, or else insane or something worse. Now it seems to me obvious that he was neither insane nor a fiend. And consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. And even if we read the Bible correctly, even according to the Bible, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he did not die on the cross.